in a resigned manner. He has to face the fact that nobody will be near him when he dies. But a man like this is aware of these things. He does not possess anything, so he has nothing to lose. In such, he can settle with his fists, and he can rise above sneers and pitiful chatter by ignoring them. He does not attach himself to any person because he knows that he will only be a burden to that person. And he does not want to burden anybody out of love for them. His philosophy of death is cool and wise. He will accept death as he accepts every passing moment of the day. Being, as I mentioned before, religiously inclined, he will most probably accept death, whether on the road, in the hospital, or poor house, as a new awakening into eternal life. In his old age, as he plays with children that pass by, or acts as advisor to young people, the man to whom pride and honour mean so much is satisfied with the knowledge that he has lived a full life. Life, free without giving or enduring insult and always being true to himself. And like the bubbling of good things inside him after a dinner pipe, he will remember with happiness all the little fine and naughty things he has done. And certainly when the sun shines for the last time upon him, he will be recognized by his God and by his few friends of long ago as a true that's kind of sparked some uh, controversy to, to some degree. The gentleman of pleasure, and that, that whole term, what exactly is meant by gentleman of pleasure? I think some people have misunderstood that. You know, I think in his lifetime, perhaps Gregory Malcolm caused it. Policy, and maybe even now, posthumously, there is an element. I think, some, uh, I think the, the, it's very good to hear that somebody at the University of Harvard has shown some interest in these stories. That you know, maybe we, we could be talking about an author here who's going to get international recognition. I don't think yeah. Yeah. Oh. You, you, you've heard, you've heard it. Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, right. You're your one. Right. Yeah. A great assistant. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> On the negative, negative side, I think somebody misunderstood the, the term. I, I think I heard from some source, and I won't embarrass that that source, that uh, um, Gregory Nelson once said to a friend, you know, I'm a bum, but I'm a intellectual, I'm an artistic bum. I'm probably misquoting him so well. But somebody kind of, kind of misunderstood, I think I heard from another source, that somebody said, oh, uh, Gregory Nelson doesn't seem very Singaporean because he seems to be wanting to be a bum. It sounded a very, I don't know, very Singaporean, boring response to a writer that I think is, is so interesting and so kind of, um, what, what, what's, what's, the, what's the word, word I'm looking for? Unique in the sense that he's, he's writing on living a life, but also the fact that he's drawing upon such weird and wonderful international reading. I, I think at the time when he was writing, most of the writing at that time was coming from the University of Singapore, was also quite intellectual, quite high for looting. Gregory Nelpons didn't come from necessarily the most humble of backgrounds, but he was somebody who seemed to kind of democratise Singapore and his kind of representations. So I think that's, that's kind of uh, quite interesting to some degree. I'm worried we've, we've lost our mind, and so I don't know how long we've got you know, to, uh, to carry on, but uh, I'll carry on regardless until somebody says, sit down, shut up. Um, and I, I thought perhaps I would try and finish. There, there, are some, there are so many things in here that I would like to read. But everyone's, most of you have got homes to go to, HDB or otherwise. But um, um, perhaps I'll, I'll finish off by reading the end of The Rose and the Silver Key. But I would just say this as well. I think Cyril made a very um, inter interesting uh, point about the fact these are not just stories, they are essays. That's quite interesting. In Malaysia, the essay seems to be a revered um, literary form. In Singapore, for whatever reason, perhaps somebody should write an essay about this from the film already. Why the essay seems to be a neglected literary form here in Singapore would be interesting to, to see what findings people made. But yeah, it's, it's 
strange that many people have said to me, the stories are wonderful, but the essays that were written on were a great, it seems so, so very interesting, perceptive. Not only Gentlemen of Leisure, which I'd like hopefully all of you perhaps to get a chance to read it, perhaps you can steal some of the copy and read it if you're going to buy it, so look, look, look in a, a live room or something. But also, one of the stories that, in a way, I found profoundly moving was uh, Impressions of Island Life, which is talking about life on the South Islands in the 1950s. You know, it just seems such a wonderful Malay Muslim, Indo Muslim life that was, was going on on those islands. And I think that's something quite wonderful about now old stories that, you know, the Malay community or, you know, is, is kind of represented almost privileged in these stories. I think that's, that's kind of quite interesting and important. But I just found it very moving doing some research on these islands. You know, the simple life that was going on with those. Islands, and now, what do I find out? What are they now used for firing practice? People move from those islands and they're used for our brave boys and green to do their kind of firing practice and so forth. It's, it's kind of resonant in its own way. It's kind of sadness of reading those stories. It's not like Brigham Young has to shake his fist. I think he makes the point, you think, that's where my Singapore has gone to, to steal some of his phrase. Okay, right, so let, let's, let's finish off before I say anything and end up in Changi. <laughs> I'll just read the end of um, the Rose and the Silver Bee, if you can remember where we were. So I've lost my page. Is that right then? Yes, that, that's right. I'll just say it's wonderful to have attentive students. <laughs> Even if they're sitting in the back row. Okay. Right, so remember where we were. It was getting dark. He applied a match to the novel on the carbide lamp and it hissed into life. And I love this in lots of, of the stories that he writes. This point of light. Well, I don't really have a Singapore like that anymore. That we, you know, see in Singapore by the light of a carbide lamp. Just that, that pinpoint of light seems to be so haunting in these stories. Fatima went around the stall and faced him. She reached up to up to her throat and dangled the silver key teasingly before his eyes. I'm not to her. Before his eyes. Come, my darling man, she said, let me have that rose. What happened next was accepted as an inexplicable omen by many people. A ginger cat ran across the road directly into the path of the speeding car. Fatima screamed and covered her eyes as the shriek of the cat rent the air. When she uncovered her eyes, the car was gone and Hamid was on the road examining the still body of the cat. It lay on its side, its body slightly flattened, its eyes closed, and its teeth bare in a frozen snarl. Hamid picked it up by its tail and threw it towards a corner of the rubbish heap. Then he went back to his place by the stall and proceeded to wash the used glasses and cups. Fatima sat on her bench, shivering a little. A moment later, she began laughing hysterically. Look! she shouted. Look at that damn stupid cat! Everyone looked, turned to look at the corner of the rubbish heap where the body of the cat lay. But it wasn't there any longer. The ginger cat was trotting daintily down the road as if nothing at all had happened. When Fatima recovered herself, she told the other customers by the stall, it must be Hamid's rose that returned it to life. That rose must possess remarkable qualities. No one disputed her statement. It wasn't worth the storm of abuse that would pour from her divine lips any time anyone contradicted her. Hamid, as usual, displayed no interest in whatever she or anyone else said. My Hamid, I must have that rose now, Fatima said. I'll even lend you my silver key free of charge. Hamid appeared not to hear her. Fatima pleaded futilely with him and then left the Sarabat stall, shouting abuse at him as she crossed the road to the bar when she worked, where she worked from 8 to a quarter to 12 every night of the week except Fridays. With Singapore changing so much, uh, uh, I think it's resonant, this story mentions the Café Theatre, I'm going to read this, this uh, next bit, we just passed the Café Theatre in the taxi getting here, it still exists, there are mo aspects of Singapore that still kind of exist, so this place don't be yours. you know, the sense of place in this story is kind of quite interesting. Okay, nearly finished. Right. Yes. So, where she worked from 8 to a quarter to 12 every night of the week, except Fridays. 
It was almost eight o'clock and the carbide flame hissed brightly on the stall. Hamid served a new customer and then went to inspect his rose on the rubbish heap. Its petals seemed filled with deep red juices. Lifting his eyes, he saw Fatima mincing her way into the bar. A boy came with a container of rice and dal gravy for him. It came from a shop in Ben Coolen Street, and the boy delivered the food regularly. Hamid paid him 30 cents from the cash drawer, washed his hands carefully, and began eating with relish. Afterwards, he belched in a satisfying manner, washed his hands and the container, and sat down again to admire his rose on the rubbish heap. Such a large red rose on so frail a stem. Hamid was content. Customers came and went, but business was not really very brisk. At around 20 to 12, hordes of people poured out of the cafe theatre after the late show. No one stopped for a drink at Hammond's store. They were all rushing for the last bus home. Just before midnight, another crowd of people came out of the bar across the road. A little later, Fatima left the bar with a group of five young men. She was laughing. They got into a fancy saloon car and drove away. After a while, Dobie Gort was deserted except for cars passing now and then. Stray dogs investigated dustbins and starlings twittered and wheeled amongst the rooftops. Hamid lay flat on his bench and after a last look at his rose, dozed into a light sleep. Three hours later, he wakened. He sat up, stretched and yawned. The night was cool. Someone was walking slowly towards the stall with a spark of surprise. He recognised Fatima. Her hair was rumpled as though someone had tried to wrench it off her skull. Her arms were scratched and etched with wheels and bruises. Her kabaya was torn and her eyes were puffed up. One of them almost closed. There was blood on her lips. Hamid went to her and guided her to a stall where Fatima sat and wept silently. Hamid did not ask any questions. He made her a coffee and forced her to drink it, scalding hot. He soaked a rag in warm water and wiped her face gently and cleaned from her lips the clotted blood until they became sweet again of the petals of his rose. He wiped her arms and hands and her neck where the silver key on his chain reflected the hissing point of light from the carbide lamp. Hamid took his handkerchief and inserted it into her kabaya to cover the tear and with a gap tooth comb he smoothed her hair. Fatima let him do all of this without a word. Her eyes were dull with the shock of how the five young men had treated her. Her bangles jingled and exploded in little golden stars as they caught the light of the carbide lamp. And she felt a strange sense of childlike wonder and pain as Hamid walked to the rubbish heap and returned with his red rose. He placed it in her hair and Fatima wept again because she could not bear the pain of the sweetness of Hamid's rose. Hamid drew out all the money he had in his cash drawer and shoved it into her purse. He hailed a taxi that was passing and guided her into it and watched its rear lights until it turned the corner and disappeared. Hamid went back to his stool and sat down. Towards dawn, as he cleaned the counter with the rag, he found the little silver key where Fatima had been sitting. As he buried the silver key under the rose stem on the rubbish heap, he noticed that a new bud was opening into red petals, soft as Fatima's lips.